Hello, welcome to Local Edition. I'm Leslie Layton. You know, the way we vote is changing. The majority of people in Orange County don't even go to the polling place anymore. And cyber bullies are going to be held even more accountable with us now. As Assemblyman Matthew Harper to talk about those issues and a couple others. Welcome. It's great to be here. Yeah, so the majority of people do mail-in ballots right now. 60% at least in Orange County are opting to vote that way. It's convenient and in the future, they are going to be restricting the number of polling places in favor of uh, places where you go drop off your ballot and in favor of increased mail-in ballots. There was a uh, vote center bill that was approved uh, by the uh, legislature and signed by the governor this year. And so uh, not in this election, but in the uh, next election in 2018, uh, you're going to be able to see a lot of these vote centers. It's going to make it easier to vote early, uh, easier to vote on election day. Uh, some of the positive things about that is they'll be able to track if people uh, have tried to attempt to vote in multiple counties. Uh, and so it'll be able to prevent that. So there's some things uh, in that bill that'll make voting more secure that but I think you is have positive. a bill, bill that is focusing on safeguarding making those kinds of voting uh, efforts safer that's right uh, my concern is uh, sometimes with our vote by mail option uh, which is an option that a lot of people like to use uh, there's three states that are actually only vote by mail uh, at this point uh, but we need to make sure that there's in ballot integrity and there's safeguards on those vote by mail ballots uh, one of the things that uh, the bill that I had uh, did it, is address uh, those vote by mail ballots uh, can actually be counted after if they're received after election day. If there's a postmark by election day, it can rece be received up to three days after election day. That was a bill that was authored by Lou Correa just a few years ago, but it had one hole in it. Uh, there wasn't a definition that was given in terms of what private delivery services could be able to deliver. My concern uh, was that a political organization uh, or, uh, or, or a party uh, could start uh, delivering ballots after Election Day themselves and say, hmm, we received those on Election Day, but there wouldn't be a real way to be able to track it. And so what my bill did is it made sure it defined it the way I think it was intended, uh, which was a service like FedEx or DHL or other mainstream delivery services uh, could accept it if they got it by election day and deliver it before those three days. And so it, I think it prevents a situation of if we have a close election, political organizations posing as a delivery service. What about the simple potential for fraud? I get my mail-in ballot in my mailbox that's not exactly locked up. You know. well, well, my bill, uh, which was uh, AB 2071, just addressed uh, that issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem was, is while my bill uh, helped improve ballot integrity, uh, other bills have made it so I think we're going to have less ballot integrity with those vote by mail ballots. Uh, the problem being uh, what's called ballot harvesting. It used to be you had to have it so that uh, your mother, father, uh, sister, brother, spouse, daughter, or, uh, or son uh, could handle your absentee ballot and deliver it to the mail or deliver it to the uh, registrar of voters. Uh, but there was a bill last year uh, that actually made it so that uh, anybody uh, could touch that ballot. And the concern is that there's political organizations or political operatives that may start collecting unfilled out ballots, fill them out themselves, and then send them to the registrar, uh, or uh, intercept ballots, maybe not deliver them. Uh, and so there's a lot of funny business that I think can happen if we uh, uh, loosen up the system on vote by mail too much. Hmm, very interesting to think about in these uh, election times. Uh, one of the other bills that uh, became law had to do with cyber bullying that you were uh, an author of and uh, the cyberbullying that you're interested in is video cyberbullying. And the thing is, is, as a conservative Republican, uh, honestly, most of the bills and most of the proposals I had, uh, you know, they died in committee. Uh, but fortunately, some of them were very bipartisan in nature, and this bill was one of them. Uh, and it makes it illegal, or and it makes it so that uh, if there's a, a video uh, that's used to bullying, and sometimes that bullying repeat, repeats after the fact because it's posted to social media, maybe a kid is uh, hurt or beat up, uh, then it gets posted, the video gets posted on social media, and it's almost like it's happening well, to it the, uh, the victim over and over again. It blows up, it goes exponentially. used to yeah. be able to, you'd have one bad day, and it would be one bad day, and yeah. now it can go on really forever if something bad and happens. And so what my bill uh, d does, uh, and uh, now will be, and now as law, uh, will make it so that uh, administration can use uh, suspension uh, and expulsion in the case of using that kind of bullying uh, to really make their consequence. 
uh, for this new kind of bullying that's happening to kids everywhere. Uh, it's an uh, epidemic uh, at the grade school and uh, in junior high levels. Uh, and so uh, this, this social media component of bullying, really, uh, we need to empower schools to be able to deter it and punish. It's interesting giving the schools leverage, but what about uh, the argument that where do schools have the right to reach outside of the campuses into private lives and police that? Do schools even want to become the policemen of the Internet? Well, in this case, you have incidents that are happening on campus, and so that's where the nexus is, is what happens where the vice principal or principal uh, or other administration officials should be able to intervene because that's the issue uh, that you have, and not having it repeat, you know, over and over again, whether the students are in school on their uh, uh, on their electronic devices or after school on their electronic devices. Um, another bill that you were looking at is um, felonies being able to vote. Uh, uh, felons being able to vote because now a lot of the criminals who used to spend time in state facilities and prisons are now being pushed out to send, spend their time in county jails instead of prisons and they're able to vote. And that's one of the other things that we dealt with on the elections and redistricting committee which I serve on the vice chair for uh, and I objected very strongly to this issue in the Constitution uh, it says that if people are imprisoned and they're convicted of felony uh, that they're not eligible to vote uh, but with this realignment uh, some folks uh, thought, hmm, maybe there's, there's, there's a loophole here uh, to try to give uh, folks back the vote. And uh, that's with this realignment. They're sending felons that should be in prisons to our local jails to serve out their prison sentence. Uh, and so they're making them eligible because they're t technically not in prison. And it's going to create a lot of difficulty, I think, uh, because not only is they're trying to administer a get out the vote effort uh, inside of a jail, uh, you also have, because of concentration of jail populations, it could affect a small town or a small voting jurisdiction. Uh, those uh, votes that uh, come, from a, come from a jail that may not be uh, other, uh, in another location. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I think the people who have committed a felony and are still serving time behind bars uh, have uh, forfeited their rights to be able to vote at that time. Well, maybe it should address the offense, not the location of where the convicted person is held. That's right. Uh, and, and me and many others agreed that uh, if you convict of a felony and you're behind bars, you shouldn't have the vote. Uh, but what this bill do, uh, did is it passed uh, and it was signed by the governor. Some people might be campaigning for those votes. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> you have a captive audience. Uh, another bill has to do with those electric bikes. Yes. You can ride them now on pass paths as well as on the street. Now, how does this work as far as the speed limit and the relationship between other people who are enjoying those uh, roads? So this is a bill that I was able to get passed uh, last year. Uh, it was uh, forwarded uh, to be able to make it so that low speed electric bikes uh, would be able to be uh, used on trails, uh, bike lanes, etc. And so on those bikes there's a governor. It makes it so that they can only go up to 20 miles an hour. But some people use them to commute. Uh, but the thing that I've found and th what I've heard from uh, local residents is people who maybe have an injury and they're trying to work their way back up. Maybe they're getting older and they need uh, a little bit of help on the hills but still want to be able to recreationally enjoy maybe the Santa Ana River Trail or the Huntington Beach Trail. Uh, they want to be able to still be able to use their, their bicycles and those were technically illegal mm -hmm. uh, before I and so my bill got... I see street though but uh, what about a road? I mean uh, a path, like a, a bike path. Correct and uh, in my bill what it was it was incorporated into a bill of uh, one of my uh, Democratic colleagues uh, David Chu and so it passed and it made it so that you can do that and being low speed it makes it so there's not a problem being able to conflict with other bicycles on the trail and so a lot of people are going to be able to enjoy uh, the outdoors that weren't able to previously. And it's all about traveling at a safe speed in yeah. relation to everything else. Matthew Harper thank you for being with us today and glad you could join us as well.